back again. I just want to thank you, Sadie, for setting this up as always and thank Final Draft for making this happen. Um, as she said, I'm Sade Sellers. I'm a screenwriter and a producer uh, based in Burbank, California. And I'm so excited to introduce you to, well, five women today. One of my mentees couldn't make it because she's working very, very hard in New York. But I want to introduce you to everyone else. <clears throat> Over 3,000 of you registered and currently there's like 500 of you here. So we're going to get into it because we want to answer as many questions as we can for you. So I'm going to introduce them one by one. We're going to get a little bit of their background and then we're going to jump right into the questions. So I'm going to start with Miss Lauren Williams. If you will unmute and unvideo yourself and give us an introduction. Hi. Um, I'm Lauren. Um, I'm a writer producer who lives in Los Angeles. Um, for the last couple of years, I've been working in unscripted television as a producer for, um, you know, your garden variety reality TV, but also, um, you know, game shows and, and things like that. Um, I'm on the Producers Guild. I uh, just got elected to the national board and, um, yeah. So now I'm also transitioning more into scripted content. So that's me. And just a disclaimer for everyone watching there, some of uh, the ladies are currently or just getting on to their new shows and they can't give you the title. Um, so, but they're gonna tell you as much as they can about their projects. So just to let you know, they can't, you can't ask them what the show is, who the company is, but they're gonna try to give you how they got there, what the process was, and all that information. Welcome, Lauren. So excited to have you. You look gorgeous. Um, next up, I wanted to introduce you guys to Sakia Dorset. She is based in New York for all my New Yorkers out there. Sakia, if you unmute and unvideo yourself and say hello to the people. Hi, guys. Hello from Brooklyn. I'm Sakia Dorset, originally from the Bahamas. Um, now residing in Brooklyn. I've been working in television marketing for about 10 years. Um, been working on documentary side of television. Uh, just won a GLAAD award for my documentary for NBC. And now I'm getting into feature filmmaking, uh, more narrative. So working on a few feature scripts right now. Um, I've done a lot of shorts and I think now is time for getting ready. Yes, Akia, thank you for being with us. I know you're you know, in New York three hours ahead. So it's mid afternoon where you are. Bless you. I love your plants. <laughs> Thank you. Quarantine plants are my favorite. <laughs> Next up, I want to introduce you guys to Ms. Taylor. Taylor, if you unmute and um, unvideo yourself and then say hello to the people. Hi, everyone. I'm Janice Taylor. Um, I write feature screenplays and original pilots. I'm actually in North Carolina. Um, my favorite genres are horror, sci-fi, and thrillers. Um, I've written several screenplays. Um, I'm currently working on a horror script right now um, that, a horror feature right now that boasts an inclusive diverse cast of characters. And a, a couple of my scripts have won some uh, <laughs> competitions, our yes. in the list and competitions. So we're going to get into the competition. There's so many competition questions that I definitely just want to knock those all out. So um, a lot of you guys actually, I'm a competition winner myself, well, finalist. So Welcome, Janice Taylor. Um, next up, Ms. Caitlin McCarthy. Please on mic, unmute yourself and say hello to the people. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin. I'm based in Massachusetts, and I graduated from Emerson College's um, MFA creative writing program. I write features and original TV pilots, and one of my features is currently in the works with Rhino Films with producer Stephen Nemeth and director Tom Gilroy. And awards for my writing include the Academy Nickel Top 50 Script Top 10 Female Writer, uh, Featured Script on the Blacklist, and Honoree on the Bitch List. I love it. I can't wait to get into that competition talk, especially as a Nickel finalist. I think a lot of people in here have so many questions about that one. Yeah. Um, welcome, Caitlin. Last but certainly not least is Miss Regina Kim here based in LA. Regina, on mic and on video yourself, say hello. Hi, I'm Regina. Um, I am originally from the Bay Area and now here in Los Angeles. I am mostly a horror writer. Um, a lot of my writing focuses on Asian American representation and Western horror. And I recently graduated from the MFA program at UCLA uh, this past June. 
And my last um, mentee couldn't be here, like I said, Fanny, but Fanny actually, um, out of all of us, she is not a writer. She is training to be an agent. Um, I really wish she could have been here because that perspective of what it's like to read a script as someone is an agent in training would have been so interesting, but maybe we'll get to do this again if you guys like it and Fanny can make it. This are, these are beautiful women, very talented filmmakers, and I'm so excited to have you all here. Just so everyone knows, um, the way this came about is I, I was sitting at home and I wanted to help a woman. I wanted to help someone. I was like, I need to help. I need to do something. I'm not by any means the most famous screenwriter in the world, but I know a few things um, being in LA 11 years. So I put out a call on Twitter and I got so much, uh, I got so many responses. I was overwhelmed and I said, well, I can't pick one. So I settled on six. And what really, um, what I really want to express to you guys who are out there saying, you know, how do I get a mentor? How do I get a mentor? The reason why I picked these six women in particular is that they were ready for a mentor. And I think that's a conversation that all of you are willing to accept. So what does it mean when you're ready for a mentor? Well, as you can see, most of them have either had jobs or working on jobs um, or going to school. Regina at the time was still in school. Um, most of them had won awards of some sort. So I actually got to see that there was work being done and that they just needed that extra leg up, that little room. And a lot of what I've done, and the girls will tell you this, it's not like me saying, hey, I got a job for you here. It's more so like, let's talk about your issues, your problems, your what are you what are you going through, your your scripts, your offers that you're getting. Let's let's talk them through, and then um, if I know someone, let's introduce you guys. Or and then with them, they even outside of this, they build a friendship with each other. And I know you guys read each other's scripts and you talk. And that was really the whole point. Um, it's like Issa Rae said, you want to reach out, and that uh, and that's really what the entire point of coming together was. So. That's how it came about. Someone asked me my DMs when I'd be opening it up again. Not anytime soon, you guys. So um, what I will say is there are really great people out there who want to mentor, um, but you have to be ready. You have to have your scripts done. You have to at least have something palpable for people to see that you do take this seriously because it is an investment. Um, with that said, we're going to jump into some questions, you guys, and we're going to start, kick it off like this with the competition stuff, because I'm already seeing the competition questions not only come in from people who submitted early, but people who already are in the chat. And I actually want to answer, uh, we're going to answer this one right now. This one is from Nick McDowell. What practices are recommended from going from writing spec scripts to getting rep staff slash your scripts sold? That actually wasn't about <laughs> the competitions, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, kick that one off to Caitlin. Okay, uh, well, the way I got Wonder Drug set up, um, it was because of uh, existing relationships. I met producer Stephen Nemeth, who's the CEO and founder of Rhino Films back in 2013 at the Squaw Valley Screenwriters Conference. And we really hit it off and he became a, a sort of mentor to me and encouraged me and we didn't, I didn't think of him as somebody who was going to be able to make my script at that time. I was hoping he would, but um, it was, you know, he was taking an interest in my career. And it wasn't until this past year when he saw the heat that Wonder Drug was getting through the competitions that he said, you know what, I think we should do this together. And I said, yes. <laughs> so that's how it came about. I can't stress enough, when you're meeting people, try not to look at them as what can you do for me? Try to think of it as forming a relationship. You, you're planting seeds and you don't know how it's all going to grow. But um, if you're too desperate or coming across as wanting something, I think that can be a big turnoff. Treat people like a human being. Be their friend. I mean, it's great to have friends in this industry. Anyone else have something to chime from going from spec scripts to just get, for getting rep to getting sold? Regina, I know you have something. Like you had a lot of um, spec scripts because of school. And then um, eventually, you can't say what the project is, but you did just acquire an open writing assignment for a feature. Did you have to submit samples for that? Yeah, so my journey was a little bit different. I think that goes to show that everybody has a different path. Uh, back in October last year, one of my horror scripts landed on the blood list uh, as a fresh blood select. And so that really opened the door for me. I started getting a lot of emails and messages. I was meeting a lot of people around town and earlier this year, there was an open writing assignment that I had submitted to that script. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I went through the whole interview process. I got invited back to pitch and then invited back again to pitch for all the producers. 
And then I did get the job in early April. Um, and, and then that is what I used to get uh, my manager. So it was a little bit different where at that time, I was very lucky to have been meeting with a lot of other uh, management companies. So when I got the open writing assignment, I made a list for myself, like who are the top three managers I would like to work with, um, reach out to the first one. Luckily, she was like, let's do this. And that is how I got my manager. And I'll chime in to wrap up this question for you, Nick. Um, I had at least, I want to say three spec scripts. I had one feature and two pilots before I even found my manager. And I didn't query. I actually, my journey was different like Regina's too. I actually happened to go to a mixer event when the world was open and we did those things um, here in Burbank. And I bumped into a woman and we talked for two hours. And it wasn't until after, to Caitlin's point, after we had spoken for two hours and laughed and got to know each other that she was like, well, I'm a lit manager. And I said, well, that's really weird because I'm a screenwriter looking for a manager. And it happened that way serendipitously. So um, I think you have to absolutely have spec scripts. And then for getting them sold, it kind of gets different when you do get representation because your spec scripts that you just wrote to get representation now could possibly become something that you can sell and pitch. So I don't think you have to, by any means, write something else that's sellable. I think you just have to get into that place where everything you're writing can be sold, but just know in the meantime, it is gonna just be a calling card for you to hopefully get a meeting, a representation, something like that. Um, so to go back to the original question that I thought I was answering, um, this is from Sage Holloway. I'd love to know about the process of how it works getting on the blacklist and what happened for you. So I want to start with you, Caitlin, in your process, and then I want to go to Janice because you've also won a few competitions. And I want to hear about what was your process, you guys, with submitting for these competitions, hearing back, what happened after you won or placed in them? Okay, um, I just want to clarify, I didn't, I haven't yet, I should say, I didn't make, haven't yet made the blacklist, but I was a featured script on the blacklist website. Um, and it's a great place to start. Um, the way I got on their radar is because I submitted my script Wonder Drug for evaluations and it started scoring um, top scores eights, nines, and I was dying. And, uh, and, and, and if you've ever had this experience with the blacklist when people actually are responding to your work, it's so exciting. Could you real quick for um, people who are very, very green, what is the blacklist? How much does it cost to get notes and just take them through that? Okay, um, the blacklist was created by Franklin Leonard, who is a superstar. And if you're not following him on Twitter, please do that immediately. Um, he is the real deal and he's very supportive of up and coming talent and he's committed to inclusive talent. And I think he's doing a great job opening doors. Um, I can't say enough about them. Uh, to get on, you have to pay a hosting fee and then you have to pay for an evaluation. And it, usually it takes two evaluations so you can start making the top list you know, depending upon what rating you're getting. And then from there, if you get an eight, that's when it starts getting promoted to um, people within the industry. They get an email. And then I had no idea that Wonder Drug was up for consideration to be a featured screenplay on their website. So when I opened up that email one day, I almost fell over. I died. <laughs> it's very exciting because they design a special poster for you, for your screenplay, and you get to work with them on that. And then they promote the hell out of it on social media and they keep it on their website. So again, I, I know there's some people who sometimes wonder, should I be paying for these evaluations? Is it worth it? I would say yes, because um, I do truly believe, because I've experienced it, um, this opens doors, it, it, it gets, helps get you noticed, can become a calling card, and I do believe Frank, Franklin Leonard is on the right path, the right mission, so I support them. I agree, if we're gonna endorse paying for anything, definitely the blacklist, I would, I would totally say. I would also like to, to throw in the people who are giving you evaluations that does not make you a bad or a good I mean it does I mean makes you a good writer Caitlin absolutely <laughs> what I meant to say is that you should not um die by a, a review that just because someone didn't enjoy your script and they give you a low score that doesn't mean that you're you know not worthy of in, in, in any competition, uh, Janice, if you want to jump in here, especially with the competitions you won, I know, you know, this year, uh, fellowship season was really rough for me. I entered four fellowships and I made zero. But again, I had a movie come out last year. So what does that really mean at the end yeah. of the day? <laughs> if yeah. you want to tell us about the competitions you were a finalist in as well. Um, I would say, I'm clarify, I'm a semi-finalist in, um, I think it was San, San Francisco um, International mm -hmm. uh, Screenplays. Um, cover, um, for Coverfly, I've been on the red list for 
ooh, for a while now. Last year, I was, um, uh, I'm still top 20. I just checked it. I was like, oh, okay, my script is still in the top 20 for um, action uh, uh, television uh, series um, pilot. Um, and it was the early, it was the top 20s now, it was uh, before it was a uh, competition getting stiff, uh, it was before yeah. I was uh, in the top 10. So um, I basically, my suggestion is, is find the competitions that are um, reputable, um, that to spend your money on. Because competitions, they cost money. And evaluations, they cost money. So research, um, I definitely um, recommend the Blacklist. Um, and Austin and Nichols, and it's a couple more out there that is slipping my mind right now. But and you know, research them. Make sure that this is something that you want to do. Have a polished script ready to go. Meaning, letting letting you know, your have a network of writers, um, your friends, like you know, this group here. You know, read your scripts and give you feedback, and be open to that feedback. And take what's you know the the most common thing theme that they're picking on or not picking on, but giving you a recommendation on changing and work on that. Don't submit something right off the bat because you're like, this is a brilliant idea. So I've done that. I've, I've done that, and I have <laughs> and I have gotten some feedback on certain things with a low score because I didn't wait because I thought my writing was great. So right. my um, suggestion to anyone new or anyone who's trying to get in this business who's thinking about joining in competitions, make sure you send the most polished work that you yeah. can, yeah. get as much feedback from other writers, other writers, not your friends and your family, because they're going to love you. <laughs> get other writers to read it and be very open and thankful for that time that they give you that feedback. Yes, and that's a great point. Please be grateful to the people who are reading your, your scripts. It is, it's time, it's energy, and there's nothing worse than when you read someone's script and then they're just horrible. And now, Sakia, how is competitions different when it comes to also being a director? Um, you know, I was just actually typing a, an answer to someone, and I honestly think it's about trying to find your path in showing what you can do. And I think that's really about just creating. Um, and so, you know, when I started, I really just started shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and really kind of getting that experience because there's nothing like just doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's going to get you ready for that director's moment. You know, you have yeah. to work with a lot of different types of actors. You have to work in a lot of different types of sets. You have to work on a lot of different types of content for you to know um, what problem solving there is. And I think that's the part of being a good director is really being able to have that experience. And so just like writing that you have to do it every day and you have to keep doing it and keep doing it, I think that's the same. If you want to be a good director, you have to keep shooting and you have yeah. to be on set and you have to keep working. And, and such great advice because being a director is honestly just being like a manager. Honestly, it's managerial skills. You have to work with every department. And if you don't have that temperament, it's not the job for you. Um, now, Lauren, what is, what I actually don't know this, this answer because I don't know if we've specifically talked about that because you do come from the, uh, you know, reality TV world, but have, what's your experience with competitions? Do you have any, a different experience than everyone else? I wonder. Uh, so I've entered tons of competitions and I only got to like the semis on one, like last year for the macro, for the blacklist, mm -hmm. and that was it. <laughs> so, that's, my I mean, that's, real, that's realistic. But <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and Regina, you were on the blood list. Someone had a question. I can't find it, but they did say, what is the process like when you got to the blood list and then after the blood list? Yeah. Um, let's see. After I found out I placed on the blood list, I mean, shout out to that team. They're amazing. They're really great people. Um, <clears throat> but after that, I mean, I would say like the very next day is when all the emails started flooding in, like mm -hmm. whether it was, oh, I read your script on the website and I loved it. Can you talk a little bit more about what that ending meant or something to producers, to managers, to people just wanting to meet and, you know, getting to know who I am and what my writing is about. Um, I did get pretty far in a in an interview for a TV show, um, but at the last minute they kind of moved up to Canada. So they were like, "I'm so sorry, but we're we're hiring a, Can a Canadian writers' room." Yeah. So stuff like that. But really, just getting to meet people was 
uh, for me the best part because yeah. before then, you know, I was still in the school. So I was really just focused on the writing portion. Like, let's get my portfolio together. Let's get all the scripts together. So this really just jump started me into getting to think about the business side of writing as well. So really the best thing for me was getting to meet a ton of people, um, getting to, you know, like interview, practice my interview skills and all that kind of stuff. And which is a, is, is a good point to make when the world was open, the best part about going to these, uh, placing in a festival, I placed in the TV one screenwriting third annual festival. I was top three. I didn't win, but because I placed in that festival, that company TV one network reached out to me. I want to say three months later and hired me in an open writing assignment. And that film was deadly dispatch and it came out last year. So even if you don't win, you guys, sometimes it's just enough to just get into that placement. But like Regina said, um, the best part of all of that, not just winning and getting a manager, it's that you, when the world's open, get to go to these festivals and meet other people. Cause that's really how you keep the relationships building. And unfortunately we don't get to do that this year, but hopefully we figure this COVID thing out and then we get to do that again. Um, so, okay. That's going to end our, uh, uh, discussion about competitions. We could talk about competitions all day long, you guys, but at the end of this uh, chat, I will give you everyone's uh, Twitter handle if, they're, if they want to open it to you, and you can ask them about all the competition stuff directly. So now, ladies, we're going to move through some questions, just rapid fire, so we can answer these much. Um, I want to do this one because Regina brought up that you were working on your portfolio during school. So Jeffrey Moyer asked, how many scripts do you recommend having done and ready before seriously talking to producers and agents? Lauren. Um, I mean, I personally only have three. I have uh, three pilots, um, but I took the shotgun approach because I didn't know um, where I was going to be let in. So I have one supernatural procedural drama that's hour long. And then I have a half hour animated comedy, um, w which actually led to my, my job that I just got um, the other day. And then I have a half hour uh, single cam comedy. So I just took the, like, like how, how, where can I go? And, you know, who else can read me kind of thing. That's yeah. fine. Caitlin, same question. Well, that's actually a great question because I've seen people get ahead with just having one script written, but it was an incredible script. Yeah. And I've heard you know people say that they'd rather see one masterpiece than a whole lot of mediocre scripts. Um, for myself, you know, I've written several feature screenplays before moving into writing uh, TV pilots. Um, and again, you know, was entering competitions, going to film festivals, networking. But um, I, I would say you want to have at least two because you, I have been asked in meetings, what else do you have? And you really do need to have an answer for that. Uh, they're not going to be too jazzed if they hear that you spent 20 years writing one screenplay, you know, because if, if they're going to hire you for something, they're, they're going to want it within a certain time frame. So just keep that in mind too, that um, you don't just want to have, you know, a, a lot of screenplays, but you don't want to be someone who becomes so um, like paralysis by analysis you know, where it takes forever to write something, at some point you have to kind of let your baby go. So just get in the practice of trying to bang a feature screenplay out within like six weeks to two months if you can. It's, it's, it's just a good practice. And um, I know some people are laughing at that. <laughs> and then uh, for original TV pilots, it depends on how long it is. You know, if you're writing a hour long drama, I mean, you, you can write something like that in two weeks if you're really motivated. No, you really um, could. But you, you know, motivated. it usually takes about a month. Um, but again, you have to be committed, disciplined, on schedule. It's possible. I get up sometimes at 3 a.m. to write before my survival job, which is she teaching does. in a public high school. So, because I find I write better before work than after work. Everyone has their own thing, but you got to want it. Yeah, and to piggyback off of you real quick, um, I had three when I met my manager, but I will tell you, I've had 10 generals since quarantine off of one of my scripts is just getting me along. It is, it's done very well for me, but then of course they say, what else do you have? And I just don't feel like my other two scripts are as strong as that one. I rewrote that script for full transparency about eight times. I rewrote it, revised it eight times and it's the strongest it's ever been. And that has gotten me 10 generals. So um, again, the, you need one really strong one, but you should follow it up. Um, uh, now I wanna move on to this next question from Jessica Paoni, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. And this is actually gonna go to Janice, Caitlin, and Sakia. Um, 
Hey, former New Yorker here now in the ATL area. Can those outside of NYC and LA, I'm sorry, it's not going to go to you, Sakia, because you're in NYC. It's going to go to Caitlin and Janice. Um, outside of NYC and LA, speak to the opportunities in their cities or the extensive travel and or to move to LA or New York. Do you think you have to live in LA to be able to work? Thanks, ladies. Okay. Um, Taylor, do you want to go first or would you like me? Oh, you want me. Okay. Uh, I'm based in Massachusetts. So New York is within driving distance. Um, so I often will drive down to New York for meetings if possible. And I'm willing to fly out to Los Angeles too. Um, thankfully, you know, with Zoom, the internet, like you don't have to travel as much as you probably did in the old days. So I think it's possible to get started from where you are. I do think at some point you do have to bite the bullet and make the move. Um, especially if you want to work in TV, I think it's not going to happen. You're not going to get staffed on a show if you live outside of Los Angeles. Features, they're a little more um, understanding if you're outside of LA, but you need to be available. Um, please note that if you are, you know, working like your survival job, but also treating your writing as if it's a career, you can write off your expenses on your taxes. So when it comes to the expenses of, you know, gas, mileage, getting on the plane. Uh, the only thing you can't write off is hair and makeup and clothing, which is really sad, but <laughs> the rest of it you can. So just keep a little list of everything that you're spending, keep the receipts. And when you go to H&R Block or wherever, just file as a writer and whatever your day job is and um, it will work for you. Janice. Um, I, I, I'm kind of, I'm just going to agree with Caitlin. Um, with living in North Carolina, um, I have found, uh, you know, uh, you know, the writing community on Twitter has been very helpful with networking and, you know, uh, placing in a sending finalist has gotten me some attention. You know, I've had people reach out to me and ask me for um, reads on my script. Um, when I tell them I'm in North Carolina, it hasn't been an issue. You know, they haven't said that that's an issue. Um, if I wanted to, uh, as Caitlin stated, if, if you want to work on a show, I would have to make that decision to move to California if that's where the show is, but is based. And so that is a consideration. But right now with COVID, you know, this is the time to, you know, try to get out there without having to be physically in California. So there, there is some concerns when everything opens up, like, uh, you know, if I make it, if, if, if I want to get on the show, you know, I may have to make that decision to move to California. So yes, I do think that is, a, you will have to make that decision at some point. Um, if that's best for you. Yeah, I agree with you, ladies. Um, Sakia, this is from Henry Samara. What advice for, um, do you have for someone who wants to start writing a screenplay but is afraid of ridicule and failure? That one makes me sad, Harry. Harry, not Henry. <laughs> um, I have to say, if you are not insecure about your work, then you're not a creative. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> you, you definitely doubt yourself. Even when you're on the blood list, you're going to doubt yourself. Even when you get the blacklist, you're going to doubt yourself. <laughs> it's, okay, it's okay to um, not be a Kanye West, but sometimes I tell people to channel your inner Kanye West. I think for me, what, caught, what um, prevented me so long from writing a feature script is because I was scared. And um, I was just like, I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. And so just one day, I just started. I looked up at the time. Um, I could not afford Final Draft. Thank you so much, Sade. Uh, <laughs> no, thank you, Final Draft. <laughs> thank <you. laughs> um, and thank you, for Final Draft. And I just started writing just in Word, just in Word. And I just wrote a bunch of it. And then I sent it to Staples and I printed it out because I'm a person that needs to see it and read it. And I just did it. And I think you can't let the fear consume you. You just have to do it. So channel your inner Kanye and get to work, Henry. Put that on a t-shirt, channel your inner Kanye. That's <laughs> the confidence of this man. I love it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna answer this question for myself from Jennifer Guam. What do you mean 10 generals? And I apologize, you guys. Sometimes I, I throw out terms and I 
I don't realize that some of you don't know what that means. So a general um, is an industry term that we use for, it's not a job interview per se, it's kind of like this producer or this networker or this showrunner wants to get to know you as a person and a writer for maybe a future job. So through my manager, I've gotten 10 since quarantine. Um, based off that one script I told you about, it, 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 I wrote it, rewrote it eight times until I thought it was absolutely perfect. Um, it is the script that when my manager send out that people respond to the most and it got me 10 generals as in 10 quick little hour meetings with these people who may keep me in mind for a possible future either open writing assignment if we're talking features or uh, to be a staff writer if we're talking on TV shows. So that is what that means. Jennifer, I apologize. Um, I, I want to ask this question for um, Lauren, because I actually know, I mean, I don't know if this is the one for you, but I, I pretty much know how your week has gone. Um, they wanted to say, Desmond Bailey, Lauren, what was your worst moment, the moment where you doubted your career path or your, even your ability as a writer? Okay, so... Uh... <laughs> This week has been a, a week of ups and downs, shall we say. Um, so I just got my first uh, a job as a, a script coordinator for an animated show in Nickelodeon. Um, and it's gonna be going for like two years, so yay, first thing work. Yes, um, but uh, before that, like I, I mean, good Lord. Um, I had, I mean, when Chade was uh, putting this together and was like, oh, hey, you know, we're gonna talk about, you know, your your careers and your I was like I don't know what I'm going to talk about I'll be honest with you because I can go up there and talk about that time I worked on that Desperate Housewives show but like I don't really have anything else because it, I was uh I was getting rejected left and right from all these jobs and it was just it was lots of and then you know also I'm like a single woman who lives in Los Angeles and like mm -hmm. in this apartment by myself I don't even have a dog like you know in time of COVID so it's just like I haven't seen another human in so long <laughs> it's okay <though. laughs> um <laughs> and so yeah it was just it's uh yeah it's it's been a, a bunch of ups and downs but honestly um one of the things that has been really great about this time in COVID is that people are being more open to reading your work. Uh, so that is, uh, I, m I mentioned the, the three pilots that I have. So one is an animation pilot, and I sent that out um, to a couple of different people who said that they were open to reading new writers, new voices. Um, and so, yeah, that led to the long and twisty pathway to my, my new job. So. And she's, she's being real chill about it now, but she was not feeling it last week. She was really like, I, I, I'm going to do this, but I don't know why I'm doing this. And our literal conversation, Lauren, I told her, I was like, you don't know what can happen in a year. It happened in a week. She literally got that job offer two days later because life just happens like that. So as down as she was... <laughs> Look at what happens. And now she's on this career path that, you know, you know, and we both, I think we all can relate to this, except for me, Regina, I think you're the youngest one here. But the rest of us are, we're not, we're young. I'm not gonna say we're old and, and crippled, but we're not in our 20s. And uh, we are, you know, you know, we're not 20, you know? So it gets to a point where we all look at ourselves and go, oh, I should be here. I should be at this level because I'm this age. And that just goes to show you that is absolutely BS. Your journey is your journey, which is why we're doing this today for you guys to show you that there are five different, six different people with different journeys because it just happens the way it's supposed to happen for you. So even though sometimes I look at like Rihanna, I go, she's my age and she's a billionaire. What am I doing? That's her journey. It is separate from my journey. And you just need to accept that. And it takes all the pressure off. So just because if you're a certain age, doesn't mean it's over. You're, you're still in this. This question is actually uh, directly for Regina. And I do love this question. It's from uh, Nadine Nator. Regina, you mentioned trying to increase representation of Asian Americans in a genre of Western horror. I'd like to achieve, achieve something similar with Arab Americans. What advice do you have to write powerful scripts increasing representation of any group without making the story solely about the cultural background of the character? Oh my God, a question. Good luck, Regina. <laughs> oh my God, that's hard. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think for me, when I started writing horror, um, I had to really think about what scares me. And to me, this, the scariest thing in my life is sleep paralysis. And so that was kind of like the inspiration behind my first horror pilot. 
But then as I started writing about that, I realized, you know, I had to make it really personal. It was easy because, you know, the subject matter itself, I've, I've dealt with sleep paralysis pretty much my whole life. But then, you know, you start thinking about my background and how that informs my writing. So for example, as an Asian American, I do think we have a very different uh, journey and a different attitude and perspective of um, our, our place, you know, growing up, growing up in America, but having, you know, a Korean background. And so for me, I had to really think about the cultural differences too, and how to blend those into my script. So I think, you know, like overall, I think you have to get really, really personal with your work first. Um, really think about what makes your identity, um, you know, interesting and why you're the person to tell this particular story. So maybe start there, at least that's what worked for me. And, and then just thinking about kind of like how your different cultures can inform the particular story that you're telling. So for example, with my script about sleep paralysis, I thought about, you know, the divide between Western and maybe Korean culture where Western cultures are like, oh, it's sleep paralysis, you go to therapy and you, you take medication and all that. Whereas my parents would be like, you gotta get acupuncture and you have to drink herbal tea and that kind of stuff. So thinking about the differences and how you can blend them to fit your identity. That's a great answer, um, uh, Regina, because I think about that self, especially I think Lauren Zakia and Janice can relate to this as black women, especially it's always like that finding that balance between I just want to be a human being and live as the story, but also I have a duty to my people to tell it authentically as well, um, without it being pandering or overuse. I mean, because a lot of times we'll see the reactions on Twitters for movies that come out that's just so like left because they don't like how on the nose it is for that culture. They're just like, oh, it sounds like they're trying so hard. So I think it is such a hard balance, um, but I love your answer of just infusing your personal culture and what that would mean. Um, I, I, I want to answer this question because it comes up so much and I want to have everyone have a chance to uh, respond to it. So Ray Fox asks, uh, when putting your script out in the world, how concerned should you be that your idea will be stolen? Are there ways to protect your script so it doesn't? So let's start with Janice to answer that one. So before I send my script off to anyone, even, you know, my writers, my, my support group of writers, I copyright it with the U.S. Copy um, Right Office. It's about $55 and I think someone told me that they think it went up to $75 to copyright um, your scripts. And then I um, register it with um, the w, uh, Writers Guild of America. So I do both. Um, I, if I, treatments, if it's a treatment or any, if it's just a treatment and it's not the script, I register that too. Mm -hmm. You register everything you do before you send it out to anyone to read. Um, and that's my way of protecting myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I haven't had no, <laughs> haven't had any issues, but that is my suggestion for any writer before you send it out to anyone in the world, get it copywritten and then register with, w, uh, with the WGA. Um, but mainly copyright that. And uh, in case you're not aware or you're not in America, because uh, WJ doesn't exist, I think, or at least I think it should. If you're, if you're not in America, there are some protections in your country you need to research. We're not quite sure what that is. Um, but if you're in the US, US copyright is, is online and the writersguildofamerica.com, WGA.com, they'll have that ability for you to register. If you're not a member, it's like a little bit more expensive, but like $10 more, right? It's like $20 versus it's like $10. dollars Yeah. For and it's just a little, a little insurance, a little insurance. Um, Lauren, what do you do? Um, okay. So I, I also register my, my stuff with the WGA, but um, I think one of the things that like helps me the most, or at least helps me mentally is the knowledge that, it's cheaper to just buy me off as a new writer, as a as as one who um, doesn't have like a long producing history of independent films. Like it would just be cheaper to like give me a, a token and say, okay, we're gonna give you a created by credit or something. So like people, I don't think are gonna steal from me. Is what I'm saying. Is you know that's my my deep seated belief is that it just you know when you get to the guys who have the deep pockets, they'll just they'll give me like. 10k and say okay go away 
Uh, Zakia? Um, I also do the same thing. Um, just want to let you know that that's very reliable. There's a current uh, lawsuit going on right now between a huge Hollywood person that stole a script, and this is mm -hmm. the only way that this person's being protected. So mm -hmm. register your script. The poor man's way is to put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and send it to yourself. So if you can't afford anything, just put that piece of paper in an envelope, send it to yourself. That way you can open it up and say, on this day, this is what the idea was. Um, I've been a little bit more liberal these days. I'm also just telling my idea on Twitter. I know that's not as, uh, you know, traditional, but there is a tweet mark and I have, I describe exactly what it is and say, this is the script I'm doing. So when any time comes back, I know on this date and Twitter archives everything. So. And just one more thing with the poor yeah. man's, don't open the envelope unless there is an issue. And when you go to the court, you hand that envelope to your lawyer and they will open it up in the court for you with a copy of the, the date on it. So don't open it when you send it back to yourself. Guys are so smart. Caitlin? <laughs> okay. Everything they have all just said, um, definitely I register my scripts with the WGA East. Because if you live east of the Mississippi, Thank you. Thank you. You, you need to be with the WGAE. You do not need to be a member. You could be a student. Um, you could be a regular person. As, and you can register anything from your, your idea, your treatment, the screenplays, multiple drafts. Highly recommend doing that along with the copyright. Um, something to remember, you can't copyright a title and you can't copyright an idea. The only thing you can copyright is the expression of your idea. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to, because um, I know people share log lines on Twitter, and even when I was getting promoted on the blacklist, they shared the log line. Uh, my manager actually told me, because I had it on my website, log lines, he said, get them off your website, because you know, as um, Sakia was mentioning, it's, it's real. Like people will sometimes have sticky fingers and be inspired by your idea and you can't copyright the idea. So just, you know, I, I guess it's a case of um, who do you trust if you're sharing the actual screenplay? You know, how well do you know them? Um, if it's, it, cause there are, there's a wonderful writer's community on Twitter, uh, but if, if you don't feel comfortable with these people, uh, don't feel pressured into sharing your script with everybody if you don't want to. Yeah. And on the Blacklist website, you can uh, have select it yourself as the writer where only industry people can download your script that um, mm -hmm. regular screenwriters you know, may not have access to or they need to get your permission. Um, so again, if, if you want to keep things private, you know, within the industry only, you know, that's fine. That's your prerogative. You're not a bad person. And um, please don't let anyone make you feel that way because sometimes I get script requests and I feel badly that, I, you know, I've been told by my manager not to share my script publicly um and i'm not trying to be a jerk it's just i'm following his advice so just yeah. do what's right for you do you and if somebody doesn't understand it then you know that's their issue it's not yours and before i get to your answer regina i also want to throw out there um because caitlin brings a good point you can't you can't copyright an idea you can just do the format and i think everyone in this uh who's attending today needs to realize you all have usually the same idea sometimes I think that is a point no one really wants to realize is that, oh, we all kind of think alike and we all, like, I tell you, I've read like 10 dating in LA stories since I've been here from just friends. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've read 17 versions of friends that came on the air 20 years ago that are now like, oh, we're friends, but we're millennial friends in, that's new girl. You know what I mean? So um, sometimes I find writers get up in arms, oh, they stole my idea, but your idea wasn't actually that original it was very blanketed and no you didn't they didn't steal it you just happen to have a similar premise as someone else i'll say it for myself second responders um because it's never gonna get made now i went in for a general at disney remember generals where there's just those meetings where they're getting to know you and they had read second responders and my script is a, a horror thriller about a woman who becomes a crime scene cleaning um, operator in, in Las Vegas and she ends up working for the mob to clean up their crime scenes before you know they get caught by the cops. She sat me down she said I really love the show but Fox is doing a show called The Cleaning Woman. It's based off of an Argentinian project 
and they didn't steal my idea and I didn't steal their idea because I didn't know. It just so happens we had the same idea because that's what happens as humans. Now, what I will say is if you find yourself and your ideas are similar to a lot of things that are coming out, don't get discouraged. Just know that you're on the right track, that you know that what you're coming up with, that's the thing that people are buying and you should be really proud of that. And I was super proud of that to hear. Okay, so I wrote something that if it had not been this Argentinian show, would have probably got bought. And I'm very proud of that fact. Um, so Regina, wrap us up with that. And then I want to move on to answer some more rapid fire questions. Yeah, I'm kind of torn how to answer this because I agree with everybody and what they've said. Like, I, I, I mean, I do agree with what Lauren said. I think it's cheaper in the long run to actually buy your script or your, you know, whatever you're coming up with. Mm -hmm. And once you get to that place I don't think I, I just think it's way more hassle and time and effort for someone to like steal your script but then hire someone else to write it and then go through all those revisions rather than just buying your script outright um, I would say maybe peace of mind copyright I do copyright with the US Copyright Office um, but yeah I mean what people have been saying is true you can't really copyright an idea as well so yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's my answer. I agree with what everyone has said. Great. And um, I saw a question here. Someone said, is there any Latinx representation? Me, girl, um, I, I know I don't look like your standard Latina woman, but my family is from Honduras and Belize. And there was another question that I wanted to, because it was directed at Takia, um, and I wanted to find it. It was also about being Afro-Latina. Here it is. I can't find it. I'm so sorry, you guys. I thought I had it. Um, but it said something about how you are able to, to blend both sides or so you don't get pigeonholed because I am Black and I am a Latina woman. And it was such a great question. If I find it, I will answer it properly. But just to answer the broad question of being Afro-Latina, um, it is really hard because I, I look black, like I am a black woman and I am also Latina, but people don't tend to wanna hire me for work because I don't, I'm not a white Latina, if that makes sense. And that seems to be like the, the makeup of what is actual acceptable Latin representation sometimes is that I, I have to look like Eva Longoria and I don't. Um, I will say it's getting so much better for Afro-Latinas. I really feel like there is a big um, push Oh, great. And Satina, oh, so, so Sakia, I want you to answer this question too, because you're uh, Afro-Latina from the Caribbean. So um, they can't see this chat. So go ahead and answer it uh, publicly. Um, I think that this is a really great time for us. And there is a really lack of Caribbean content. And I really want to try to expand on that. Um, this is the time for representation. Uh, when I was in a writer's group, I met uh, Diana Peralta, I think her name was. Mm -hmm. And at that time she was writing her script um, that just got picked up by HBO. Mm -hmm. Her script was the closing night film at BAM Cinefest, which is a huge film festival in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it was about two sisters traveling back to, I think it was Puerto Rico to bury their father. I think the more specific that you can get at this time People want something that's different. Um, I think Regina also said this, writing from a personal space is almost like you can't steal that. Like yeah. if you're writing from a personal space, how can you steal the story? And how many people have your experience as an Afro-Latina? Um, yeah. You know, I'm from the Bahamas. Nobody, everybody keeps confusing it with Barbados. Nobody knows what goes on in the Bahamas. Nobody <laughs> understands the struggle of an immigrant coming from the Bahamas to America. What is that like? Could you imagine if there was a script that was good that expressed my story, um, which is another script that I'm also writing. So I think this is a time to really get even more specific and try to stop writing something that you feel is palatable, you yeah. know? Yeah. Because that's the easy thing, and there's a, enough people writing those scripts. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great point too. I, I, and every as we know, um, black people, women in period, but black people, especially Afro Latinas, the dysphoria is so different. It's a different trajectory for all of us. So Sakia's story is going to be different from my story. Um, my again, I'm um, uh, and my mom's an immigrant. She's a green card holder. She's not an American citizen. Um, our family doesn't speak Spanish. That all also counts me out. It makes me feel really insecure when I tell people I'm Afro-Latina, but I don't speak Spanish. But I grew up on Honduran and Belizean food. So 
my story is completely different from someone else's. So injecting that into my scripts rather than saying, I'm going to blanketly make it Afro-Latina and what people think being Afro-Latina is, it doesn't make sense because it's not going to be honest at all. Um, so thank you, Sakia, for finding that question. And thank you for the person who asked that because um, it is... Uh, it is important that we talk about that. Um, okay, so rapid fire, rapid fire. Uh, Regina, and I'm sorry I'm giving you all these questions, but I, they're for you. <laughs> I wanna break into an Asian market. I'm from rural US. I understand breaking into the US market can be done international, but I wanna go international if you have any information on that. I don't have information on the international market just because I am Korean American, so I kind of write to what I know. Um, I do know they have a lot of money, uh, but that is kind of all I know about that. In terms of horror, <laughs> the Asian horror market, uh, that market is very well established overseas. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not too sure. I can't answer that fully. Okay. Um, Lauren, when collaborating, how do you make sure your idea doesn't become their idea? Um, I mean... I think uh, communication is like the blanket answer, but I think uh, written communication is uh, definitely the thing because I had a friend and I who were uh, collaborating on a, a documentary and uh, that went kablooey. And literally I was like, well, I mean, it's my idea. And then I went back and I checked through all the messages and I was like, well, actually, no, this is more his idea than mine. So, you know, it's, it's communication is key, but like written communication, because we all edit in our heads what we think happened, but when it's in black and white, there's no denying it. Yeah. So. And Sade, can I just um, yes. piggyback on something that Lauren just said? Um, yes. I'm currently co-writing a TV pilot with a wonderful Scottish writer named Lindsay Murdoch. And before we started any writing, we um, had a lawyer draw up a, an agreement between the two of us where everything's 50-50. So it's very clear, you know, moving forward that we're partners, we're in it together. Um, We've been, you know, communicating through the written word, as Lauren said. Also, you know, Zoom has been phenomenal. But please, if you're going to collaborate with someone before you even start writing, get that agreement. It, it, say, it, it protects both parties. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, we're talking about anything, a paper trail, paper trail, paper trail, electronic paper trail. My mama taught me anything, even in communication with your landlords. Don't do it through text or do it through text, but don't do it in person. Get a paper trail, text, emails and collect yourself just to protect yourself. Ooh, fun. Um, Janice, how do you maintain your process, especially uh, when, in, when new to writing? How do you know that your process is supporting progress? That's like that question. Uh, when I'm actually getting to that finished pro uh, product, um, it's, it's like Caitlin says, you have to, especially when you're having a, a survival job to, you know, to keep you going, you're working one job to keep the lights on, and then you're having to find that well in yourself to sit down in front of a computer when you're probably been working in front of a computer all day um, <laughs> and then sit down at a computer and be uh, and push out creativity um, and, and get into that mindset. So one, you need to be disciplined um, and you have to want this. You know, you have to want to do this. And, and I'm, I'm just going to jump back onto this imposter syndrome that, you know, us as creatives, we go through. Um, sometimes you, need, you may need to take a break from writing or whatever creative process um, to get your mind back together and then you come back to do it, um, back to um, writing and, and being a creative person. So my suggestion is whenever you have um, to, to do this, you have to want it. You're going to have to want to sit down and write that story because as a, as a writer, I don't know how any other writers work. If I have a story idea, it just sits there and keeps talking to me. I wake up with the idea, I wake up with a scene, I wake up with a dialogue. And if I don't get it out, it's just still going to nag me like a, you know, a second personality. So if that's something that you want to do, if you want to be a writer, set a schedule for yourself, do it. I have an uncle who's a novel writer and he writes a hundred words a day or a thousand words a day, a thousand words a day. He makes yeah. it mandatory that he does that. And if he can't write on the novel that he's working on, he writes on something else. He writes a poem. He, he writes a short story. He does something to keep that muscle going. So yeah. if you want to do this, go for it. Set a time and a schedule for yourself and, and keep at it. And, and don't doubt yourself because you have this talent, you have this gift, and use it. Yeah, I will say the, the hardest part of this 
uh, being a writer is the first draft. It's just starting, honestly. Once you get done that vomit draft out, you guys, it just becomes easier. But <laughs> just sitting down to start, so painful. Um, Sakia, this is from Mike uh, Kodova. Hey, I've written a feature with a director and an award-nominated producer attached. They started having meetings, then COVID hit. What's the best way to get a manager out of this? I am currently unwrapped. Any suggestions there? She's thinking. I love this. She's like, I want to think. <laughs> I, I would need to know more about Mike's situation. Okay. Because if he has, if he was so close, then the doors are already open for him, mm -hmm. it seems. And he would just need to send some cold emails if I were him. Yeah. I, mean, I don't feel like Mike is very far away if he had all of these award-winning folks attached. Am I, what are people thinking? Now, Mike, why don't you drop a little more background info in the chat? And I want to circle back because my thing too is it's like, you need a, uh, the manager conversation, you know, we talked about representation. It, sometimes it's just like, it happens organically. And sometimes you do have, like Sakia said, you got to go out there and you got to start querying people. You got to like get them into your world and your orbit to let them know you're there. So give us a little more background. We'll circle back to that. Uh, Regina, um, and then obviously I think Janice and I can attest to this too. Can you talk a little bit more about the horror space and representation? How many other minority women have you encountered in the horror genre? Uh, any other networking places for us horror girls? Yes. Yeah, I've always heard that um, women in particular are like the greatest fans of horror. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like the writing side, the creating, the create, the creative process to it, I'm not too sure because I feel like most of the people I know writing horror are white men and yeah. I think that goes to sh show that when we're watching these uh, horror movies and, and tv shows we that's kind of what we see reflected back to us and so that was kind of my biggest challenge as a writer I knew I had the power and the freedom to challenge that aspect to it um, growing up I didn't see a lot of Asian American representation in Western horror which is why I was like this is what I want to write I want to see that reflected back to me um, so I think in general the tide is shifting a little bit just because there's so much great horror out there now um, all the content is getting a little bit more diverse as well so I think that we're slowly starting to shift but still have a long way to go yeah I, I would say again um, uh, Janice and Regina and I are horror horror writers and uh, there is a huge huge uh community of horror writers in general but also a lot of women of color horror writers on twitter as well um mm -hmm. there really isn't like a group of us that get together she said to to do structure and stuff but i think if you're on twitter please follow all of those women in horror not just the writers the ones who are making videos um i love ashley blackwell she is now an educator uh, of history of horror at a college i can't remember which one but she also did the horror noir for shutter she was the co-producer and co-writer for that one um there are a lot of women on twitter right now who you can just engage with um, that look like you and that love the same genre that you do. Um, uh, okay, so this is for Lauren. I'll, I'll give this one to Lauren. I feel like having television writer experience enhances your ability to complete a pilot. How do you move past that thinking and go straight to writing your pilot? Uh, it's used to be a, a spec show, sorry, every time I get a question, this thing moves up. Um, it's used to be, uh, you could use it as a spec to demonstrate your writing and now competitions want pilots. Okay, so they're basically asking like, how do you even get started writing a pilot if you haven't worked on a TV show? Um, so a lot of false starts, I think. You just kind of have to brute force strength, or at least that's, that's what's worked for me is just like, and uh, the, the first uh, pilot I wrote was pretty terrible, <laughs> but you know, you just gotta write it, you know? And, um, and then I guess keep, I think, uh, what, I don't know what they said, percentage of writing is rewriting, um, mm -hmm. but like, that's really what it is. You just gotta get it out. Um, you have to have your idea going through your beat sheet. For me was the most painful process is like, of like, okay, I know, I have this idea of like what I want and then now I have to go through this 
connects to that, connects to that, connects to that, and going all the way through. That was the worst of it. Um, and then after that, you just, you know, keep going, just keep doing draft after draft until it looks less horrible. But the yeah. first bit is going to be horrible. And then piggyback off that, because someone did ask a question uh, about books and, and books on writing. Um, I'm a firm believer that if I wanted, if for me, uh, if you want to learn how to write a script, you need to read scripts, um, number one. So uh, again, I didn't go to school. How many of us went to school for writing? Because I actually don't. So Caitlin, Lauren, and Regina. Janice and Sakia and I did not go to school for writing. I actually dropped out of my school because they didn't have a writing program. So I'm completely self-taught. Self -taught. Again, everyone's journey is different. So when I wanted to learn how to write scripts, I went online and I literally Googled screenplays. My favorite is scriptslug.com. I would say it again, script slug slug.com. They literally upload a new script like every day scripts that are current, scripts from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, pilots, um, they have TV and features. And I literally will sit there and I will read as many of them as I feel like I can get through to a day. And that is usually how I write. So especially if I'm writing a TV structure that I'm not familiar with, 30 minute comedy, for example, I'll pull up a script from New Girl and go, how did they do that? How did they make this joke? Um, so for me, I think if you want to learn how to write screenplays, you need to read them. So I'm giving you the tool right now, the website scriptslug.com. It's free. You can download it, take it wherever you want to go. But what I also advise you to do is take that script, especially if it's something that it's streaming online right now, and watch the movie as you're reading the script and see how it translates from the page to the screen. It's the biggest help in the world. Um, Sakia, from Lernerna Patrick. And I also want to clarify our Afro-Latina conversation. I am, my family is from Honduras and Belize. I was not trying to equate the Caribbean with being Latina. It just is, was confusing, but I just want to clarify that. I was trying to read the question and ask Sakia the, the answer. So, and again, my family is from Honduras and Belize. Okay? Um, Sakia, would you say that you've made advances in your career because you're, you were writing and directing your own projects? I've written several shorts, directed two, and have a feature and a web series, but want to continue writing, acting, and directing. How was your experience? I mean, they don't even need to ask me that because we can see from the Issa Rae, from the Ava DuVernay, mm -hmm. and most recently from uh, Blitz the Ambassador, what it's like when you struggle to get your, your feature made or and it gets to the next level. Um, I was actually writing a response to this. And I think the first step that I did, you know, when I was producing is to just make the documentary. And I did not know where that documentary was going to go. It ended up getting distribution. It ended up getting into many film festivals. And then that ended up um, getting me the opportunity to make a documentary for NBC. So I have to say, unless you have some big budget superhero script, um, if you have the means and the network and the community to make your script, why don't do it? Why, why, why not do it? Right now, um, I usually do Airbnb, but my Airbnb is vacant. So I'm writing a specific script around the space I have available that I'm going to be shooting um, hopefully by November. And that I, I have to say, just keep creating because every single thing I've done, um, I've learned something. And it's in that creation where you learn. So um, Lorena, definitely keep going, act in it. Um, let's not forget Spike Lee. The only, yeah. the only reason that we're like, oh, Spike Lee, we know his face because he's in the he's movie. Nice. Yeah. Ben Stiller. I mean, there's, there's so many examples. Uh, Seth Rogen. There's so many examples of it working out. Yes. Um, so just like she said, you, you just do it and, and do it smart. Work smarter, not harder is my mantra for 30s. Um, just like Sakia and her empty Airbnb, my first short horror short is terrible, but I'm very proud of it. It was shot here in my living room. And I wrote it to be shot in my living room. Uh, you know, containment works well in horror. And also I was broke. So <laughs> like, you just have to make it work for you. I love this um, kind of question, kind of compliment. It's from Amika Ohori. I feel like Lauren is the successful version of myself. <laughs> what is a sentence or a mantra or mantra you want to, uh, you say when things are not going well or a rejection occurs, this is what I'm doing, but I want to make sure the process is more palpable. 
actually I just came up with one last night because we're going through this whole thing, right? Um, uh, with RGB's passing, um, I literally was like, you know what? My ancestors have gone through so much. They survived so that I could thrive. And that is really how I refused to have a breakdown several hours ago. <laughs> I was like, no, my ancestors have gone through so much. They have gone through so much. I can put up with this. There you go. I, I think that too, especially when, and I'd be remiss if we didn't mention we lost a great one yesterday, Miss RBG. And as I was drinking my red wine, trying to figure out what is life, um, there has been worse situations before. My grandmother has lived through worse. Um, my mother has lived through worse. And now it's, it's my turn, but we shall survive and it, this too shall pass. So I love that nod to our ancestors and rest in peace, Mrs. RGB. We would not be here without you. Um, so this one's from N-A-J-W Sharp, N-A-J-W-A Sharp, and I want to give it to Caitlin. Is it possible to sell your scripts without working in a writer's room? Um, well, features, yes. Um, with regard to TV, that, that's a little bit more of a challenge, but I will say regarding TV, um, I did have a chance to pitch MTV through Women in Film. They once had um, an opportunity where, because I'm a member, by the way, um, as a woman, you can belong to a Women in Film Los Angeles, New York, any other chapters, you do not have to live there. I actually belong to multiple <laughs> Women in Film chapters, uh, the New England one, New York, and Los Angeles. But through the Women in Film LA, I got to pitch MTV. I also was part of the Pitch Fest for UCP, which is you know at the Universal Studio. Um, so it is possible to get in the room to pitch your original idea. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier, um, it's hard to get staffed if you're not living in Los Angeles, just because you're not there for the meetings. And it, it is a bit of a turnoff to some people that, you know, if you have, like for me, I have the 508 area code. Um, th 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 there's just a mental block. Um, I, I do think the pandemic has been a blessing in disguise in terms of, you know, the Zooms and people are, you know, lightening up a little bit about being together because we're all kind of afraid to be together at this point. But um, things will change. And I, I think if you want to work in TV, like myself, at some point, we will probably have to move to Los Angeles. Um, but there are some writers rooms in New York as well, and also in Atlanta. That's something to remember. And uh, but features seems to be a little friendlier to people who live outside of the industry. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that as someone who's sold a feature that that trajectory was just, I mean, feature writing is hard. It's really, really hard. Um, but mine was made for TV movies, so it's also very different. But uh, to be honest, you guys, when it comes to selling a TV show, it's about packaging. And if you don't know what packaging is, it basically means what is padding your script to make a network want to support it. So that means you have to have a really, really reputable uh, showrunner, someone, because showrunning is not just about guiding the story, they're managing million dollar budgets per episode. That's someone who has to know how to do that. Um, and then of course it comes down to, do you have uh, an actor who can anchor the show that will, people will come week to week to see them. So it's a whole thing. I will, we'll, what we said, it was what was said before, just write your script and make it great and let all the other stuff, I won't curse, fall into place where it needs to be, but just write the thing first. Don't worry about that. I want to pitch this one to Taylor, uh, Janice, sorry, because we, we talked about this early in our uh, relationship can, from Gary Judice. Can you please describe what should be in a query letter and how long or brief? And he says, thank you. Um, so uh, one thing I'm gonna, a little tip that I've learned when you're doing a query letter, the subject line, put the RE, like you're, re that you're responding to something um, uh, that the agent is responding, like you're, the, you know, the RE in the subject line, so RE and then a semicolon, and then your subject line, um, note who you are, you know, you're, you're, you're querying for representation in the subject line, and then in the body of the email, um, you know, say, you know, hi, how are you doing? If you know anything about that agent or manager that you're querying, give a little, you know, uh, you know, I, I think it was a, a manager that I uh, queried. I, 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 I followed him on Twitter and he, li he liked to do happy hours. And I spoke about, hey, you know, since it's, you know, COVID, have you thought about doing a Zoom happy hour with, you know, some type of game? And I opened that up, opened the mm -hmm. query, 
with that. And then I went into, I'm looking for representation. I gave him a couple of log, log lines for two different scripts. And I ended it with, you know, um, you know, be happy to, you know, you know, send these in to you if, if you're willing to look at them. And he did respond and ask for, sam for, the, for one of the samples of my writing. Yeah, and then so, just, but, to, just to clarify real quick, if, if, again, if you're green, a uh, query letter is, uh, uh, it's you reaching out to an agent or a manager to um, ask them to read your work. It's cold emailing. You're, it's it's cold. technically, it's not a relationship isn't built there already. It's like you find their information somehow, IMBD, I don't know, somehow it's on their website, and then you cold email them with this proposition. Do your research on that person. Make sure that you're querying yeah. the right person. See yeah. if you can find a little bit about them. Don't stalk the person. And then you can kind of open your email up with the, a personal kind of antidote or saying to them. Um, and so it, it won't seem like you're just, it's a, you know, a generic query that they get thousands of a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, finding something personal about that person. So like Janice was saying, she followed this guy during happy hour on Twitter. It's like, hey, I saw on Twitter your kid was, you know, a, a champion. Congratulations on that, by the way. You know, finding something personal so it doesn't look like you just copy and paste it and then just BCC'd a whole bunch of people. Don't do that. I got caught doing that once. It's embarrassing. Don't do that. Um, I'm going to answer this question from Titus Salomon, myself. Uh, do you all have agent or managers or both? Do managers help launch your screenwriting career and agents help you find work? I do not have a literary agent. Uh, the difference between agents and managers are only one thing it's deals managers cannot legally close deals um, agents are sanctioned to be able to close legal deals um, so I do have a lawyer as well who I will kick my contracts to after my manager set me up with um, a general meeting or whatever so your managers basically kind of guide your career they can set you up with general meetings that we talked about earlier um, introduce you to people and then but once the deal is done they can't do anything else. So I kick that to my lawyer. Agents can do all of that. Is one better than the other? I don't think so. I think, um, I think they both serve the same purpose at the end of the day. You just have to like who represents you. I, I would never say sign with an agent just because they're um, a super agent from CAA or WME um, if you don't like them. If, they're, if you can't pick up the phone and talk to them and say, I'm not feeling great today, I have that relationship with my manager. I pick up the phone before every general or after every general and we talk about how it went. And sometimes I pick up the phone and say, I'm just not feeling like writing this week. I'm in a funk. And she answers me. We have that personal relationship. So that's the most important thing. Not, oh, an agent's better than manager. Who actually can I have a relationship with that believes in me that is going to help my work? Um, I don't know how much time we have, so Sadie, let me know in the chat whenever I'm running out of time, but I still want to keep going. If you guys are willing to keep going, we've got some great questions. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the TV One yeah. um, process? Because someone yes. had asked a, long, a little bit ago about getting their script to Hallmark Channel. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the TV... Process. Yeah, I will. Okay, so to so I'm gonna wrap, I'm gonna encompass this very quickly. So stay with me. I talk fast. So uh, TV One had a screenwriting competition. They don't do it anymore, unfortunately. Um, where they would allow the the stipulation was you had to write a 90 minute made for TV movie, um, and you had to send it in. And I literally three days before the competition was on my couch, super depressed. My career wasn't where I wanted. I was working a dead end job at a restaurant that was just so abusive to me emotionally and physically and everything else. Um, and I said, okay, three days. I can, I can really like Lauren and Janice have been telling you if I really, I mean, Caitlin and Janice, if I really commit myself, I can do it. I stayed up. Honestly, I think I slept a couple of hours. I knocked it out in three days. This is probably the worst typos everywhere because I didn't get checked. I did do the bad thing. I sent in my first draft. I shouldn't have done it, but it was, it was just a, a way for me to say, can I do this? And I'm not going to just sit here and cry. I sent it in. I didn't, I let it go, which is probably the biggest thing. I didn't think about it for a long time. And a month went by a whole month. And then I finally got a call that said, Hey, you're top three. And I thought you're kidding. There's no way that little thing I wrote in three days that was not even spell check. That was the first draft. Um, they ended up flying me to Miami to go to the American Black Film Festival where they would eventually announce the winner and it wasn't me, but that's okay because I got to spend a week in Miami going to see different movies by Black people and meeting other creators um, and they paid for everything. It was awesome. <laughs> My sister joined me too because she likes to mooch on stuff. Um, and three months, you know, I didn't win. So in the winner of that competition, they would get their movie that they wrote and sent in made on TV One. So the winner of that competition, he did. He, he went to work literally 
in the next few weeks. And his movie came out a few months later. They circled back with me. Um, this was July when we went to the competition and it was October. In October, they came back to me and they said, we have a piece of IP, which is intellectual property, which is king in this industry. So if you don't know what that is, every network studio producer has a piece of intellectual property that they have paid for and that they own. For example, Jurassic Park is a piece of IP that Universal owns. So they will make Jurassic Park movies and video games till the end of time because it's something they already paid for, they own the rights, and they're going to milk it as much as they can. Okay, this is important now. So they said, we have a piece of IP based off of a TV show called For My Man, and we'd like to take this non, this reality TV show and turn it into a feature film for, you know, our network. They said, can you pitch us? Yes, I can. So the pitch basically was me giving, taking the idea of the episode. I watched the episode and I came back to them and said how I would draw this out as a 90 minute movie. I went to dinner, it was my birthday, so it happened to be my birthday. I literally got a call 20 minutes later. They said, yeah, we like that pitch, we're gonna hire you. And I said, you're absolutely kidding. Again, like why? I, I, imposter syndrome, I have no right to be here. That was a terrible pitch, what are you talking about? You guys are insane. Um, that process went on for two years. I was sending them rewrites and what they do in the feature world is you have to send in your outline and then your treatment and that gets checked off by producers. They send you notes, we don't like this, we don't like that. And then by the time you get to your script phase, you go first draft, second draft, third draft usually, and then if the third draft is good, then they'll do revisions and you get paid for every step of the way. So every time I sent in a draft, I was getting a check. I, and it lasts for, for two years. Um, and then the movie came out last year and I got, again, I got to go to set and meet all the cast and the crew who were there because of the words I wrote and got to hear my words out loud. And it was a great experience. So that is one example of a um, competition working out well. That's the story. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you, Sakia, for asking. Uh, I love telling that story because it'll never happen again in my life. So I like to relive it <laughs> anytime I can. Um, uh, oh, look, here's a little, here's a little compliment from Anthony Rodriguez. All these topics and conversation within the webinar are so real and raw, and I appreciate everyone's input and sharing. I'm going to start with Lauren. How do each of you personally see the future of your screenwriting contributions in the industry um, and for the consumers that will be enjoying your artistic work? Lauren, where do you see yourself going now that we're having a better week? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so it's... Um, after years of working freelance and like putting your head down for like 10 weeks and like focusing on a show and then like scrambling for the next job, I um, I mean, I've just got this job that's gonna be for two years. So I'm looking forward to the steadiness of like, of like focusing on this show, but then also being able to focus on my own works um, and having set up a schedule and like getting into that mindset. So I, like, what do I see myself hopefully cranking out a bunch of stuff, a bunch of content. Um, you know, I have a bunch of ideas and it would be great if I could, uh, you know. I'm happy you were saying that now. Last week was touch or go. <laughs> yeah. um, Stephanie Santos, I worked at TV One and Research. Love Deadly this set. Thank you, Stephanie! <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, it's on the TV One uh, uh, app if you guys want to watch it, please. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to pitch this one to Regina, okay? Uh, do you recommend getting an agent before pitching your pilot to your production studio? You didn't have one. Yeah. No. I mean, I didn't have any representation when I got hired. Um, like I said, mine was a little bit different where I got the job first and then I found representation. I don't, I don't know. Um, I guess my opinion is you don't need one. Yeah. Uh, but if you have one that, I mean, good for you, it's better. And then I just follow this up. Um, I, I want to ask you this question from Joseph Walker. How do you get past people who told you you weren't going to make it in your field and you were wasting your time? Because I think all of us as artists, <laughs> especially my immigrant parents are like, why are you not a doctor, a lawyer? <laughs> like, What's wrong with you? So Regina. I want you to answer that one. Yeah, sure. Um, especially because I'm Asian. But I think for me, um, I, I, I just got really lucky with my parents. They're both very artistic people. They're very creative people. So my, my mom was a dance major and she kind of like toured the world with her dance company for a while. My dad, he wanted to be a theater director. Mm -hmm. But then growing up in Korea back then, his parents were like, hell no, you're not going to do this. 
So um, he actually got into kind of like a theater program for college, but then his mom was like, no, you're doing an engineering program. So he went to engineering school. So I think they kind of knew that you can't live your dreams through your kids. Yeah. So again, I feel really, really lucky to have really supportive Asian parents. Um, I, in undergrad, I was an English major and my sister did uh, women's studies. And like, I don't think you can find a pair of uh, Korean parents who are okay with their kids doing that. But, uh, but yeah, so for me, very much uh, the support was important to me, knowing that I had the full support of my parents, it made me confident to go out and, you know, be really, really confident about my own work too. I want to ask a question, and it's not from anyone in this chat room, but I want to touch on this while we still have time. We have about 15 minutes left, and I think this is super important because we never talk about the business side of this job. We always talk about the creative, but you guys need to know the money. You need to know what the money is, and you need to understand. Caitlin, um, let's talk just quick numbers because that seems to be everyone's if you if you will be transparent with us you don't have to but be as transparent okay. as you want to optioning we talked about dollar options in private um yes. how much are your scripts worth how much should you be charging especially when you're non-union and you're not in the guild please just break it down as best as you can for people Okay, so I just want to back up to the conversation that we had about dollar options or free options. Uh, this oh, is something that- Let's go back. Can you define oh. an option? Because we just okay. got to start, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if somebody's interested in, um, basically think of it like real estate, that um, if, if so, you want to take your um, house, if you're trying to sell the house off the market, somebody will you know, put a little money down and then they go off and try to get the mortgage put together. And if they can't get the mortgage put together, you keep the money that they gave you to keep the um, house off the market while they were looking for the money. Um, and then it, sometimes they get the mortgage, sometimes they don't. If they get the mortgage, the house gets bought. It's like that in filmmaking. The option is basically taking your script off the market and sometimes people will pay you to do that, sometimes they won't. Um, and, and you negotiate that. Um, but if, if they set up the project, then that's when you get paid for your screenplay. And it's usually on the first day of shooting mm -hmm. that you get paid for your script. Um, so it, it, with regard to a free option or what we call a dollar option, it means uh, a producer is asking if they can shop around your script with uh, no money down. So you're taking your script off the market uh, while they do that. And, and you really have to think about who it is. Um, I, I've been burned a few times with free options and dollar options. I, I came to the realization for me that if somebody doesn't really have some skin in the game, they're not gonna maybe make this their first priority. But again, if you have someone who's lovely like Chardet, if, if say she came along and wanted to option, I would totally believe her because you know she's committed and so know who it is. Don't just get excited somebody wants you. You know, who wants you? It's like dating. Yeah. Don't just marry the person because they're asking like, who are you? Like, yeah. do I wanna be tied down to you? Because if you do an option agreement and they're going around shopping it to people, and the person is, and I'll be blunt, an idiot, they're poisoning your project. So even if you get your project back because you know, they're no longer attached to it, um, anytime they speak to somebody, uh, they'll remember your name, your script, and you kind of get you know, smeared with you know, their bad reputation. So just be careful with that. Um, typically speaking about how much you're gonna get for your screenplay, it really depends on the budget. And um, it, sometimes if you're looking at a screenplay, that um, you know is it's like under a million dollars. You're not going to be getting like fifty thousand dollars for your screenplay. Yeah. That's negotiated. But usually, um, even if you're not a member of the WGA, um, if you have a good entertainment lawyer, you can usually negotiate the um, WGA minimum. Mm -hmm. But again, it's you know be realistic. If you're a first timer, you're not going to be getting these multi million dollar deals. I mean, it has happened for some people, but realistically speaking, um, it, it depends on the budget. And it depends on, you know, uh, your lawyer negotiating the deal. Um, so I hope that answers. But take a look at the WGA website to see what the minimum is, because that's usually what you can negotiate. But again, if they don't really have a budget, you're not going to be getting, you know, like I said, $50,000. You might be lucky if you get $5,000 for yeah. an independent film. Uh, but it's, it's not about that script. It's about the next script that you sell. So don't, don't lose faith. Don't lose faith and um, uh, to piggyback on this too, because Dennis just asked this, are you paying agent managers up front? No, you no. should not be doing that at all, you guys. They, they, they get a percentage of what you sell. Um, 
And with an entertainment lawyer, they get a percentage of your check if you're being staffed too. If you're a TV writer, they'll get a percentage. Yeah. But go ahead, Caitlin. Oh no, but with regard to an entertainment lawyer, this is something I also learned the hard way. So learn from my mistake before they do any work for you. Set a cap. That means you say, do not go over this amount because most lawyers have what they call billable hours. Yeah. And depending on how good your entertainment lawyer is, they could be $350 an hour. Yeah. So, I, and, and look, someone asked earlier about where do we find lawyers and what's a good website to find lawyers. I don't know. I would say I'd be weary of just Googling lawyers. No, Try to find someone who knows. I asked my managers. Again, I know that's very privileged for me to say, but I asked my managers for recommendations and they actually sent me um, someone they've worked with before and I signed with him and we were able to work out a deal where I don't have to pay him for hours, nor I have to pay him for drawing a contract. But when a deal is closed, then, yeah. then he gets paid. I ha- and that was really great because I can't afford $350 an hour. I can't afford that stuff. But as yeah. a producer, I need contracts. So it, it's all about doing your research. And I interviewed like six lawyers, you guys. I didn't just sign the first one I met. I interviewed six lawyers and I asked them questions about the pay scale and everything. Um, so really quickly, thank you, Caitlin, for uh, drawing that up because I want to knock out some more. Um, Natalie Robinson, this is very sweet. Um, I would have thought that Experience Chardet would have opened more doors for you. Keep pushing. I think this is a great conversation because uh, um, uh, for all of us as women, especially women as color, yeah, you would have thought <laughs> having a movie come out last year that did pretty well um, uh, with you know numbers for viewers would have just pushed me through there. And that is not the case. And that's exactly why I wanted to do this panel today. Because um, as much experience and success as I've had, and I do feel like I have it, I'm still in the same boat as all of these women, as you guys who are in this um, chat right now. I still have to go on general meetings. I still have to write and I still have to pitch myself. I, I mean, I've had people offer me assistant positions after I've had a whole, after I've not only produced three feature films um, and had one come out and people are still offering me assistant positions, which is, we can get into the conversation later, but we're not going to. It's just a reality that exists for women. It's not a luxury that we have, that we get to have a successful thing and then boom, we're off doing a Marvel movie. I think Nia DaCosta is the first situation I've ever heard. Like Candyman hasn't even come out yet and she is assigned to do a Marvel movie. And I was so excited because that doesn't happen. If you think about, who's the woman who directed Wonder Woman? Um, Catherine, what is her name? Catherine... J- Jenkins, I want to say. Patty Jenkins. Patty Jenkins, thank you. Patty Jenkins, Monsters Ball, won an Oscar almost 20 years ago, and she didn't work for a long time after that, and she had a whole Oscar. So yeah, you would think getting these little achievements would traject you. It, I mean, again, everyone's journey is different. Some people do sell their scripts, and then they take off, and some people can work three years being successful, and, and, and they still find themselves at <laughs> PGA events with me and Lauren, like at tables going, here's my resume. <laughs> so um, so just know your journey is different, and, and you just have to be, you know, happy with that. Um, okay, this is for Sakia. Oh, and this is from Amaya Dots. She said, I'm still a teenager about to, to make my first film. My goal for high school is to get my foot into the film world as a career. I, I, she didn't ask a question, but any advice for this very young artist? Um, I think right now, when I was a teenager, what was I doing? Right now, you have to think about all the skills that you need to acquire and learn as much as you can. So she wants to make a feature film, she said? It's a short. I a short. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, one, call all of your friends right away, every single person that you have <laughs> in that phone, and let them know that you're making the film. So step one. Then I would go down the list of folks and see who's going to do what on the film set. So... Yeah. Teach each of them. You need to have your tallest friend hold the boom microphone. That's the long <laughs> sound thing. Um, you need to have your most organized friend handle the schedule of for yes. the Yes. <laughs> um, you need to find the friend that has the mother that makes food and make sure that that mother is going to be doing the craft services for you because people have to eat. Um, you have to find out where you're going to shoot. So where's your location? And ask your friends if they know people that have a house that you could shoot in. Yes. 
Um, what else do you need? Actors. There's got to be a few of those friends that are like stars on TikTok, right? Yeah, find the class clown and <laughs> find the class <laughs> clown. Great shot, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> find the class clown and find out and just let let them put something up on TikTok. That'll be their reel, right? See what they can do. See how they can act. And so I think you have everything. You need to start the list of people in your phone because you need to build your filmmaking community right there where you are right now. And you can do it because guess what? You guys are off from school. You know that you're not going to every class because it's all on Zoom. <laughs> and so you have lots of time to make a film right now. This is actually a great time. It's great weather. You have great time <laughs> and everybody's free. So get to work. I want to see it. Send it to me. Are you talking to her or to us? <laughs> like, I feel like I should, I'm like, all right, I'm going to start shooting tomorrow. <laughs> that was amazing, Sakia. That, that is probably my favorite piece of advice from today. I, I promise you I was taking notes with that. Because taking notes with my tall friend. <laughs> I, like, I have to take notes on this. this is she's, so yeah, she, I can't wait to see that movie when it comes out because I know she's going to be great now. Um, I want to do this one for Regina and myself because I think it is a really important question. Desi Van Eaton says, how do you ensure staying involved in the producing and directing of your screenplay, e.g. Goodwill Hunting? Um, now, so for you, Regina, you have an open writing assignment and you are the screenwriter. And as myself too, with Deadly Dispatch, I did not have a hand in anything else because I um, was just the screenwriter. So I wanna hear from you about just letting go of that process of knowing this is my job as a writer and letting other people do their job after that. Yeah, it was an interesting transition because I was still in school at that time when I was hired. So coming from uh, two years of the master's program where you're just pumping out like original content and very personal content to being hired to write someone else's uh, stuff, I think I really had to remind myself that they hired me. So I kind of treated them as a client. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the producers that I'm talking to, you know, they have a certain vision they hired me to fulfill that vision. Yeah. So what I can do as a writer is maybe, um, you know, pitch ideas. They're very receptive. I got very lucky. I've worked with great people, but that's all I can really do is listen to them and try my best as the writer to fulfill that, their vision on paper. I think where I can get a little creative is maybe the, the writing style, like how it maybe looks on the script or something like that. Mm -hmm. or, or how the dialogue comes across. But for me, it is really about letting go of that, knowing that they're sort of like my client, they've hired me for this job. Yeah, and I think that's such a brilliant way to answer it, uh, Regina, because you guys have to understand it. this is a writer's chat, right? So we're talking about writing. Once you're, you hand over, it's not your baby if, if you're being hired to write it open in the site, it's their baby. So once you're giving them their child back after babysitting it for whatever amount of time, you have to let it go. I will say when Deadly Dispatch aired and I watched it here in my living room, um, there were things that were there that I did not write. There were lines that were changed. There were scenes that were shorter than I anticipated because here's the reality of it. You write the script, it's the way you want, awesome. The director gets a pass. If you don't know, the director can change whatever he or she would like. They can cut things, they can add things, they get a pass, okay? Then you get to set actors. <laughs> Actors will get their pass whether they want it or not. They'll change a line. They will change a movement. They will do something just because that, that's just, they're creating their character and that's their space. Then the movie is done and the, the studio gets their pass with the editor and they're going to go take this out, format this, reshoot this, all that stuff. And then by the time you're done, this movie that you made or wrote, maybe not, doesn't look like the movie that you anticipated. Now to answer the other question of how do you ensure that you keep that intact, Yes, if you're going to direct it, you've got a little leeway, but you still have to answer to networks and producers and stuff like that. Um, my advice would be, and you can only do this when you get to a certain level, I'm currently at that level a little bit, is attach yourself as a producer. Um, so my managers know I have my own production company because I, I am a producer outside of writing and that anything I sell, again, not open writing assignments, anything that I sell on spec or whatever, I am attached as a producer, a co-producer, a very small production credit. But that gives me a little bit of say of saying, hey, you know, I can get my voice heard now. Will they listen to me all the time? No, but it gives me a little bit more power than just being the screenwriter. Again, you have to be at a certain level to do that. You can't just, as a first-time writer, attach yourself as a producer. That's insane. Um, but that's what I would do. Um, I want to, we only have like five minutes left, so power, power hour. Lauren, um, I'm sorry, Janice and Lauren, 
I have read, this is from Joshua Harrell, I have read a ton of formatting action um, uh, information. It seems the more I research, the more confused I become and now find myself frustrated. I can relate. I have a short film funded but wanted to enter the screenplay into some competitions for fun. Would love to know your thoughts and resources and recommend on the subject matter just on how important the topic is. So I think Joshua is just saying there's so much information out there about how to write a script and it's just getting a little overwhelming. So what is your advice about that? Um, we'll start with Janice and then we'll go to Lauren. I find the my most favorite movie, especially I, I wrote an action thriller and I had to figure out how to write an action scene. I had no idea. So I was like, what's my favorite movie right now? It was John Wick. So I went online and found the script and I read it. And then it was the Denzel Washington one. I'm sorry, uh, the, I want to call it the eraser, but it, that wasn't the eraser, the movie that he, uh, anyway. Equalizer. Um, Equalizer, yeah. Equalizer. And I read that script. So I compared how both um, writers wrote the action scenes. And so then I wrote I did my own kind of twist on it and, and wrote it that way um, and sent it to a couple of script, uh, script writers who also write action um, scripts and they gave me feedback. And that's how I kind of, you know, figured out the genre, how to do uh, an action scene um, and, 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 and learning how to do that. So that's my suggestion is read scripts like Shade said, mm -hmm. read Scripts, find the movies that you like, that you want to kind of emulate, read those scripts, figure out a way how to make yours unique to you or, you know, use that, that kind of mindset of how they did their formatting, use it for your format, you're not selling anything as a format, um, and then uh, apply it to yours, and then if you know any other writers who are, in, who are in the industry or who are out here doing the same thing that you're doing and they're action writers too, swap scripts and get feedback for it. And, yeah. and then Lauren, just to, to kick it off, I know it, I know there's so many books, there's Save the Cat, there's, and everyone has a suggestion about building tension in it, and it, get, it is overwhelming. So how do you just kind of muddle through all of the suggestions and, and structure stuff and, and just write? How do you just get to that place, Lauren? I mean, it's the same thing she was saying. Like, you find the things that you, that inspire you, that, you know, when you think of action, what, what does your mind go to immediately? If it was John Wick, then go find John Wick's script and, and emulate that, exactly. And I, and I also, to that point, to you guys, you should definitely learn the rules of screenwriting so you know which ones to break, but not everything has to be done exactly to the T. Like some people bold their slug lines, I don't bold my slug lines, but some people like doing it. I know Misha Green does it. Um, she's the, the showrunner for Lovecraft Country and I've read her pilot and I'm like, oh, she bolts her slug line, how cute. It doesn't mean it's wrong, it doesn't mean it's right. It just means that's what she likes to do. So take the pressure off yourself, write the way that you feel comfortable writing, but know the rules. So you, you already know it's 12 points, you know, it's Courier, you can't break stuff like that. But as far as describing action and stuff, you can find your own balance and, and create your own rules as long as people can read and understand your script. Okay. For, for Caitlin, there was such a lovely comment here and I lost it because this thing, this thing gets on here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to find a lovely comment, but we're going to do one, one group all around. Um, we'll start with Caitlin. Overall advice to being a screenwriter currently in 2020 for this lovely people. Okay. Um, Melvin Van Peebles had a quote that he used for his career. Mario, his son, adopted it and they shared it in People Magazine and it's now my, my mantra. Um, early to bed, early to rise, work real hard and advertise. You, you've got to do all that. I mean, maybe some of you want to uh, get, get up later and write later, but it, it comes down to doing the work but you can't be shy as a writer. And, and I think that's the next piece you, you really have to remember. Um, it, it's, it's sometimes a little uncomfortable. You can always spot the writer at the festival because they're the, not the ones on the dance floor. They're the ones hiding in the corner. Um, I've had that experience at the Austin Film Festival, at the Hamptons Film Festival. We're always in the corner huddled together. But um, you know, create a website for yourself, put, get on Twitter, put yourself out there and, and you will make friends. And that's the best part of this, you know, journey too. You know, you're not in it by yourself. Like there are other people and you'll start, you know, you know, cheering on their successes and don't let it bum you out. If people are getting ahead faster than you, let it give you hope that it's possible, you know, because if you know these people and you see them getting a break, it's like, mm -hmm. I'm next. And the other thing I, the odd motto I have is why not me? And, and it's not arrogant. It's a little bit of Kanye, but 
you know, why not me? Like, why, why is someone else so much more special than me? And really have that feeling about yourself that you can do it. You know, just keep doing the work, make friends, put yourself out there, advertise. And, you know, why not you? Why not you? Regina, last words for our guest today. Yeah, I want to piggyback off what Caitlin just said, but I think my biggest advice is to make friends. When I first moved out here in 2016, mm -hmm. you know, everyone was telling me, you have to network, you have to connect, you have to do all that. And as a very socially anxious person, I'm like, I can't do that. And so I think um, there was a lot of pressure that I had to put myself out there, that I had to go to all these functions and meet people every night. And I'm just not that type of person. So uh, the biggest thing that I got was make friends because make friends. we're all going to grow up in this industry together and it's friends who will help each other out more than like the executive producer right now who you're trying to maybe get in the door with. Yeah. Reach out, not up. Remember? And um, uh, Regina, actually give them, if you'd like your Twitter handle where to find you while we're here. I'll go back and grab Caitlin's real quick and then we'll finish up. Sure. I'm on Twitter at Regina Kim Wright. Uh, I think my DMs are currently open. Caitlin, what's your Twitter? Um, I'm Caitlin McWriter, couldn't fit McCarthy. So it's C-A-I-T-L-I-N McWriter. Uh, Sequia, last words and advice, um, but also someone wrote a really lovely comment to you about how you motivated them uh, to get going on their film. I can't find it, but that person was really grateful for you. So last words and advice and then where they can find you. Um, I'm on Instagram, that's my favorite platform. Um, Instagram.com slash Sakia underscore Dorset, my name. Mm -hmm. um, last words of advice. Um, Nike says, just do it. <laughs> but my words of advice is just go for it. Yes. Which is, what are you waiting for? Just come on. Just go for it. Sure. For Why it. not? I mean, it's comfort. 2020, <laughs> RBG's gone. <laughs> oh, no. Let's just do it. Right, we have nothing to lose right now except True. to just achieve our dreams. It's tough. Wow. Just, just get started right now. Janice, last words and where the people can find you. Um, my Twitter handle is um, at Tay underscore Nania, N A, Tay as in Taylor, T A Y underscore Nania, N as in name, A as in apple, N as in name again, E as in eat, and A as in apple. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I just wanted to give us a couple suggestions where, or, you know, where people are like, where can you find other writers, to, you know, to read your stuff? Mm -hmm. I got on Twitter a, a, ha a year and a half ago. I'm new yep. on Twitter. And it has the Twitter writing, writing community is the best. Some of the people are hopefully on this call, but um, they, it's the best writing community. If you want someone to read your stuff, go to Twitter, set up an account, ask to read other people. So you're open to reading people's scripts and giving yeah. feedback. That is the first way of getting yourself, getting your stuff read. Um, yeah. There's a group called the Rack Group. Um, um, it helps keep other writers get, uh, you know, stay accountable for any scripts that you have coming out that year. If you're a female of color, um, they have the, at the JTC list yeah. on Twitter. These shout are out to Cheryl. Oh, sorry. Shout out to Cheryl who created the JTC so list. Cheryl Go ahead. A great group. Um, to just, they're, they're trying to open doors for women of color to get in the industry. Um, and like Shade has said, and she has taught me this, reach across. Don't try to reach up, like Regina said. Don't try to reach up, reach across, and, and try to be a service of other, everyone. And, re, and have the realization that the only competition you have is yourself. You're, if anyone else is doing something better and they, you see that, that they, they've accomplished something, be happy for them and know that the door is still open for you and the opportunity is still open for you. So don't get discouraged in this industry when you see everybody else. You know, Sakia, she's going to make a movie. Uh, Lauren is on a TV show. Uh, Regina has so, so I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, wow, these, these women have a, accomplished really great things. I know for a fact that there's still doors open for me too. So it's, it always, your, don't, your only competition is yourself and your own mentality. So don't get discouraged in this industry. It can make you discouraged, but don't get discouraged. Keep going out. Keep putting yourself out there. Keep writing. Write what you love. Don't, don't try to set a trend. Just write what you love and, and get it out there and have people support you and make friends in this industry. Because you make friends, then you see them going up, they're going to remember you. Yes. Great. And then last but certainly not least, Lauren, tell the people where they can find you and 
give us the last piece of advice and then we're going to wrap this up. It's been great okay. though. <laughs> um, so I'm on Twitter and Instagram at LK Dubs. It's LK D-U-B-B-S because my last name's Williams. So. Anyway, um, <laughs> the only advice I really have, because I'm, I still think that I'm at the infancy of my career as well, is that uh, just keep, just keep, keep on keeping on, I guess. Uh, because I actually moved out here several years ago with people who were way more talented than me, but they, for whatever reason, they all went home. They all yeah, gave up, they threw in the towel. And I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm not even that clever, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I just, you know, just keep on and eventually your your spot will open up. Your your path will be made clear to you. That's all. And we that's it for the day. We ran way over time, but I had such a good time like listening to everyone's answering questions. So um, hashtag script, right, uh, script chat, hashtag am writing on Twitter, you guys. We want to thank Final Draft for everything, for everything, for supporting us. Um, when I asked them to do this, there was no hesitation. They just said absolutely. Also remind you, I'll be back next week to do a horror chat with uh, Jeff Howard and Kim, whose name I can't remember, but that's next week, Saturday. So please sign up for that. Um, and then my, my last thing, my last piece of advice is uh, none of this matters if the world falls apart. So make, you guys, make sure you're voting. Yes. At the end of the day. <laughs> so, um, but thank you to my lovely mentees who I love so much and, and all you guys who stayed for two hours to listen to us chat. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next time. Find us on Twitter. Ask questions. Bye.